the crooks. They're escaping. Follow me, man. Never mind the men, just the women. It's the Marx Brothers Council Podcast. Welcome again, everyone. This is Bob Gassell. And as always, I'm lucky to be joined by my two co-hosts. First, often referred to as This Generation's Orson Bean, here's Noah Diamond. (laughs) I'm glad to be any generation's Orson Bean. Thank you very much, Bob. (laughs) And from Bath, England, where he's still mourning Prince Philip, the grieving Matthew Conium. (laughs) My condolences, sir. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of my country. (laughs) <laughs> if you've ever seen the, our official synopsis for this podcast, it says, quote, featuring guest appearances by Mark's experts, authors, and notable fans. Well, our special guest today definitely falls into the latter category. Of course, you loved him in Greece, and you forgave him for Greece too. Uh, <laughs> he's also had pivotal roles in films such as War Games, 1941, and my personal favorite, I Want to Hold Your Hand where he uh, totally stretched his acting chops to play the world's biggest Beatles fan. Um, <laughs> yes. In recent years, he has become a huge presence on social media, including the Marx Brothers Council Facebook group, where everyone either loves him or tells him to stop shouting. <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes both. So true. <laughs> Let's welcome our pal, Eddie Deason. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Bob. How are you? Good. Such a pleasure to be here. Such an honor and thrill to be here with three Marx Brothers geniuses. <laughs> Well, let's not get carried away. Uh, For those who weren't aware, Eddie has been dealing with some health issues over the last year or so, but he's come back strong. Eddie, you're looking really good. Well, thank you. And I should mention that Eddie is sporting a nice dashing beard these days. (laughs) Uh, You could do Fiddler on the Roof now, Eddie. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Worst heavy in Broadway history, yes. So why don't we go back as far as we can here. Uh, Why don't you tell us when you first became aware of the brothers and how you became a fan? Okay, I was I grew up being a Three Stooges fan. I was a Three Stooges fan since I was about five. I always loved them. I didn't see the Marx Brothers until I was about sixteen. This is about nineteen seventy three. It was a late show, and they had it, I forget the order, but they had two Marx Brothers films: the Monkey Business and Horse Feathers. One back to back nights. This is like eleven o'clock at night. I stayed up late, and I don't know if it was the summer or if it was a school night, but I stayed up late both nights. I was alone in the dark. It was so dramatic, so life changing. And uh, I remember seeing horse feathers and my dad said these words to me. I've never forgot to this day. He goes, watch the scene where Groucho danced with the professors. He goes, it's the best scene in the movie. And to this day, that's my favorite scene in horse feathers. I love that scene. It's an electrifying scene. Uh, I just, I was transported to another world and I saw uh, monkey business the next night. Same thing. Just like, who are these guys? What am I looking at here? Who are these three creatures from another planet? What is this? And they were so incredibly funny. And every mm-hmm. line was funny and every gag was funny. They were so brilliant. And I, I was hooked from that point on. I went to New York the next year. I saw the uh, the opening of Animal Crackers. Not the opening, but Animal Crackers was playing in New York. You know, the screenings there. Right. I missed Groucho by one week. But I went to that screening in New York. I went four nights in a row. I saw Animal Crackers. I was so electrified and mesmerized. I went four nights in a row. I saw it. The audience was rocking in the sea. Every line, every dance, everything. The audience was just rolling in the aisles laughing. It was a joyous moment seeing the Marx Brothers on the big screen for the first time. Then, of course, I immediately got Joe Adamson's book, which changed my life. You know, the greatest book ever written. I went crazy over it. And then my parents ordered me Harpo Speaks. I was enthralled. I, I read it like five or six times. It was a joyous thing. Mm-hmm. Scrapbook was out around that time. You know, this was like things were just starting to open up. I read the scrapbook mm-hmm. and I was electrified. I loved every word of it. And uh, I just got totally hooked. And I'm, I'm a Mark Brothers fan to this day. I just I just can't tell you how much I love them. As much as the Stooges. The Mark Brothers and Stooges, it's a careful balance with me. I love them. Yeah. It's like your two children. You know, which of your kids do you like the best? Well, I like them both, but in different ways. And that's the way I'm with the Mark Brothers and the Stooges. A- any other influences or favorites growing up? Uh, oh, yeah. Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Huge influence on me. I love Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. I um I saw them both in Vegas. I saw Jerry alone. I saw Dean alone. Uh, Jerry Lewis was traumatizing when I met him. In I saw this great artist. And, I, you know, it's easy to see how much of his comedy. I, I based a lot of my comedy on him. But I met Jerry in person. And he was just the meanest. Just the meanest most. <laughs> I can't even describe it. But I was in line. I remember and I heard people talking. They go, hey, Jerry's a real asshole. And I thought, oh, don't be silly, Jerry. I'll get along with him. I get along with everybody. Da-da-da. So I'm in line. I'm like, Hi, Mr. Lewis. My name's Eddie. I'm your biggest fan. I've seen all your movies. Dead silence. I, I'm starting to feel a little woozy. I'm starting to feel a little shaky. My knees are starting to buckle. And, Mr. Lewis, you're my favorite star. I love you so much. You've influenced me. I'm a comedian, too, and I do movies. And I, I, I've seen all my favorite movies. This dude, cricket. 
photo, but he doesn't say where. So I went through, I tried to drop a few names. Some of my friends were Jerry Lewis friends. I go, I know such and such. He's a friend of mine too. Cricket. Da, da, da. Finally, I did a couple times. And then finally, Jerry goes, thank you. It's kind of kind of like a kid, you know, thank your Aunt Matilda for getting you those socks for Christmas, you know, thank you. It was kind of like a condescending, patronizing thank you. I was just absolutely traumatized. I went out. I had five DVDs. Jerry signed them all. So I go out. I see my manager. He goes, what happened? He goes, you look like you lost your best friend. I, go, I, I think I did. I go, I just met Santa Claus and he kicked me in the balls. This was Jerry Lewis. <laughs> I was so traumatized, but it took me weeks to get over the experience. Uh, that was the, the most horrible meeting I've ever, because I've met so many celebrities. I've been so lucky to meet some of these really big celebrities and directors and presidents. And they've all been nice to me. But Jerry's was a horrible experience. Not the only one, I think. I think a lot of people yeah. have got, got stories. There's like a lot that. of horror stories about Jerry. Yeah, yeah he, he was bipolar. But to be fair, there's a lot of good stories about him, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I've wondered all these years, you know, he was in a lot of pain. You know, he had a bad back. Maybe, you know, a person in pain isn't necessarily the friendliest person. Maybe that was it. I don't know. Mm. Were you an Abbott and Costello fan? I did, Matthew, as a kid. I think of all the great comedy teams in the making, they've aged the worst. They kind of like, they look kind of dated. Their routines are kind of stale. Costello was a brilliant comedian, Luke Costello, and Abbott was obviously one of the great straight men. But their material was so weak, and they, they seemed dated. Was, the Marx Brothers seemed really fresh to me. Laurel and, even Laurel and Hardy, they were before Abbott and Costello. They seemed fresh. Their comedy is so good, and I'll still rollickingly laugh at them. They were on TCM, and my mom and I were watching. We were rolling in the aisles laughing. Uh, Charlie Chaplin, I'll still laugh at. He, this is 100 years ago. This stuff's still wonderful. Buster Keaton, I'll laugh at. He's still wonderful. I never got into Harold Lloyd that much. I never got into him that much. And here's the big one that everybody loves, W.C. Fields. I never got into him. I never okay. thought Fields was funny. None of his films are my favorites. I don't know. There's just something about him I didn't like. He hardly ever made me laugh. Okay, so if we're playing the Kevin Bacon game, I guess we don't have to go very far to find your connection to the Marxes because you worked with uh, Eve Arden in Greece. Yes, I, I did. Even I were actually very close friends. I, we were just close pals. And of course, the first thing I asked her, I'm a Marx Brothers fanatic. And first, tell me about the Marx Brothers, tell me everything. The first thing out of Eve Arden's mouth, she goes, I did 75, I can't do Eve Arden's voice. I did uh, 75 on. films. <laughs> and all my kids ever want to know about is the Marx Brothers. That's all they talk about. They want to hear all about the Marx Brothers. They don't care about anything else I've ever done. And Unfortunately, Bob, she told me about all three, but I only remember one. Like she goes, Harpo was a lamb. And she almost teared up. It's like she loved Harpo, and this was 45 years ago or whatever, or 50 years ago. She still remember what a wonderful being Harpo was. By the way, speaking of comedians, I never found funny. Every night I was yeah. driven home with Sid Caesar. We were in a limo, and Sid would get in the front seat. I'd sit in the back. Go, Don't talk until Mr. Caesar talks. So, so I'd sit like an idiot in the back seat every night, and Sid would talk. <laughs> He was a very intelligent man, but I, I, I never thought he was funny. He was my dad's favorite. My dad loved Sid Caesar, but I always thought he had the face of a heavy. I always thought this guy would make a great heavy and he looks like a killer or a murderer, but I, I never thought he was funny. Lost on me too. Okay. So we're going to be going into Eddie's uh, rankings of the films uh, in, a, in a little bit. He's going to rank all the Marx Brothers films for us. But before we get to that, I've been told that Eddie has some questions for us. Yes, so, indeed. I have some questions okay. because I want to ask him. Uh, this is the first one. This is one I've had in my mind since I've been reading about the Marx Brothers. I've had this in my mind since I was a teenager. And we all know Chico. As, as Jack Penny said, Chico liked gambling and women, period. And we all know that. I always wondered, do you think, obviously it's hypothetical, we'll never know the real answer. So we got to play Columbo here and put our detective hats on. Do you <laughs> think Chico ever struck Margaret Dumont? Now, here's my detective. This is my think on it. These are the Marx Brothers. There's these crazy guys, okay? And I just yeah. see they're in a dressing room between shows at a matinee or on the set of a movie. And Harpo and Chick are in there. And Harpo goes, hey, Chick, I'll bet you 100 bucks you couldn't stop Margaret. <laughs> Chick goes, what? He goes, you heard me. I'll bet you 100 bucks you couldn't stop Maggie. And, you know, and Chick goes, I could stop anybody I want. So they might have made that bet. I figured Chick might have whatever turned his charm on. <laughs> he frosted Margaret Dumont, and I figured they made it out of an address. This is my own theory on it, but I always wondered about that. What do you guys think? Well, I don't know why you think we would have any more info on that than, <laughs> than you do. <laughs> <laughs> and people wonder why we don't get asked to do DVD commentaries. It's a mystery, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, this this theory might be in conflict with the stories of Chico having this kind of indiscriminate libido. But mm -hmm. I wonder if Margaret Dumont was too important a part of the act mm -hmm. to to mess with the relationship in that way. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if it was just kind of 
um, all the chorus girls in the coconuts or something. Right. If somebody, you know, um, if, if somebody had to leave the picture because of uh, drama with Chico, it wouldn't hurt the show that much. Whereas Margaret Dumont, if you fracture that association. He's indispensable. You know, yeah. You've almost lost a Marx brother. Yeah, which, Noah, you bring up an interesting corollary question that I've always wondered, too. We all know Chico was the ladies' man. You know, he, he shook all these women. This is what I've always wondered, too. Did Chico only like the, the Thelma Todd, the Marilyn Monroe gorgeous blonde, the leggy chorus girls, or did he take anything in a skirt? Did he just like to have sex like a male nymphomaniac? I don't know. That's a good. <laughs> yeah, no, I answer that good question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I think um, you know, Chico's taste seemed to run, t- rather, like I said before, sort of indiscriminately. Mm-hmm. However, one can imagine, you know, you're doing a lot of showbiz activities. You're surrounded by women who have been chosen partly for their pulchritude, you know, and that was always a big selling point. Even the later films, you know, Night in Casablanca, the girliest musical picture. Yeah. It was always so up on the marquee. Right. Um, But who knows what was attractive to him? I don't know. I think it's fair to say that until he was married, I don't really remember many reports of him having girlfriends, that is to say, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, any kind of long standing relationship. So I I think he did think of of women in terms of one night stands and and, until he, I think, decided to get married. So he probably just, you know, took whatever was on offer at any any given moment. But returning returning to to Margaret Dumont, I think I give the scenario you uh, outline there, I, I think I can just about imagine uh, overtures being made, but I can even more easily imagine a spectacular Dumont uh, shunning of the idea. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> the very idea. Certainly not. <laughs> I, there may be a little bit of joking, like as in the films. I My impression is that they flirted with her in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way. And mm-hmm. there's stories about Harpo hanging her undergarments out for all the world to see, like when they were on a train on tour. And, and right. I mean, I think they regularly crossed lines with her that, you know, a gentleman wouldn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but whether there was, like, any serious sexual intent, I, I would imagine. If there was, you're probably right that it would have been coming from Chico. Oh, absolutely. Unequivocally there, yeah. Okay, here's my next question. And this is one of my favorite Marx Brothers stories. It's become Marx Brothers legend over the years. But I, I've heard, I read in one of the books, I, I don't know if it was Matthews or one of the books, they said it, it couldn't happen because they, they verified a check. But it's a theater where they get in trouble. Uh, I think Groucho was smoking. And there was a little no smoking sign and they find them. And then the Marx Brothers were fine. And they, they paid them in pennies. The Marx Brothers were paying in pennies. They're counting it and they had to catch their train. Okay, they're going off in the train, and Harpo yells out as the train's leaving the platform, I hope that God, your goddamn theater burns down. Now, that's one of the great stories of all time. It's a perfect Harpo Mark story. Here, again, we play detective, we'll never know. Harpo did not talk about that story in his autobiography. He never mentioned it in that 500-page book, which is weird. But on the other hand, Groucho brings it up in Groucho and Me. But here's another weird part. Groucho goes, one of my brothers said that, uh, he doesn't say Harpo said it. He says, one of my brothers yelled this out, which, why did he say that? Why didn't he just say Harpo? And then later on in Mark's Brothers' scrap book, Groucho's telling the story, and he says these where he goes, I know this sounds incredible, but I swear to God this is true. Now, usually a, when a person says, I swear to God this is true, usually there's a kernel, at least, of truth in there. So that story has some kind of basis. But again, just to fill in all the details, I read one book that said we checked through all the vaudeville theaters in those days and no theater burned down like that. So what do you guys make of that story? Was it true? Was it apocryphal or what? Maybe it didn't burn down, but there was a fire that wasn't recorded, possibly. Uh, you know, and burning burning to the ground was a, was a you know an exaggeration. That's a possibility. Right. I mean, it does. It certainly does sound like an odd story to make up from whole cloth. Um, yes. It's it's too it's too odd, I think, to for, for it to to make sense as a as a pure invention. But but if it isn't documented, I mean, if it's not in Bader's book, for instance, then uh, I think that's 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 pretty much the last word on it. I mean, Groucho saying this is true. He did say that all the time. If you look at his uh, okay. interviews with Cabot, he, when <laughs> yeah, virtually uh, virtually every anecdote he tells, he, he gets a laugh and then he says, this is true. Okay, so, uh, gotcha, Matthew. Yeah. What about now? Interesting. 
I think a lot of those stories, just as Matthew says, like there is some grain of truth to it Mm -hmm. and it gets embroidered and elaborated in the telling over the years. I've also heard, I can't recall which source, but somewhere where that story is told, it's used preposterously as an explanation for Harpo not speaking. Like that was the (laughs) last time Harpo ever spoke. Exactly. Yes. That was the last time you were writing. That's really taken it. You're right. By the way, one of the great moments, did they ever finally buy the wrote the article where Harpo shouldn't speak. You know, the, the effect is lost when this guy speaks. And that art, that thing that changed comedy around for the universe. Do you, you know who that reporter was that wrote that article, that critic? I, I know that when Harpo made his stage debut at Henderson's Coney Island, it was the first time he was ever on stage. And uh, Minnie, uh, I think, literally pushed him on stage. Uh, the review that they got that night, which was not uncommon in their early vaudeville reviews, was the tone of it was, this is a lovely act with cute children singing songs, but there's too much talking. It's not funny. They should throw out all the talk and just concentrate on the singing. Um, but that was referring to the act in general, not Harpo specifically. I don't think I've ever found that specific pan of Harpo. Yeah, it would be interesting. That guy is immortal, whoever is, and he doesn't know what he did. I wonder if the guy lives to know what he did to the world of movie comedy. Because if Harpo had spoken, it would never have been the same. If he had kept talking, there's no way. He's just the most special comedian in the history of motion pictures. That specialness of this guy that couldn't talk in this world of talking people, you know. Also, let's say talking movies had existed 10 years earlier. Maybe the Marx Brothers would have gone to movies earlier. They had to have been in talking. It wouldn't have worked in silent films because Harpo's uniqueness would have been lost. I completely agree. I think people uh, sometimes miss the mark when they talk about Harpo as a silent comic, because he's not a silent comic in the way the silent comedians were. Almost all of his humor is still about language, even though he doesn't speak himself. Right. And the silent comedians all do talk. It's just we don't hear them. But they all have dialogue. Good point, Matthew. He talks in too many kisses, doesn't he? You'll see yes, Harpo he does. Yeah. Talk and there's dialogue there. That's right. This is another one. It's It's... Too brief for your show. I would love to hear a podcast here. You guys really get into this in depth. But because I love them both, the similarities, the differences, the incredible coincidences of the Marx Brothers versus the Three Stooges. Obviously, the two most popular comedy teams in history, unequivocally. They were both five guys. They both The odds of having five boys in a row. The Marx Brothers actually had six if you count Man- Manfred. But they had the five boys in a row. Of course, Groucho, Chico, Harpo, Zeppo, and Gumbo. And the Three Stooges had the Three Stooges, Jim Curley and... Uh, and Mo, and then they had Jack and Irving, two other ones. They were five boys too, and um, yeah, just the similarities. And then you kind of pair them off. The obvious comparison is Curly to Harpo. You know, this otherworldly guy. He pulls a hammer out of his pants. You know, and these are the two most otherworldly comedians. They're like these. What is this guy? Did he come from another planet? And these are these two, Chico and Larry. Obviously, the weakest of the three. But they gave the team a balance, and they could play off the others. You know, but. He, and Larry was kind of a chico figure in real life. He was a gambler, and he would lose his money gambling. Every he was kind of like this happy-go-lucky guy, and he was always broke. I don't know if he screwed around like Chico, but he was. There were similarities with him and Chico. Now Mo and uh, and Groucho is the hardest to match up. They were kind of like both the ringleaders, both the one you always mentioned first, you know. But the characters were were kind of different. Mo is obviously meaner, but they, it, it's harder to match those two up. But I'd love to hear you guys really get in depth to talk about on your podcast. Now I watched the Three Stooges shorts. And you'll see Curly will steal Harpo. Guy. Once where Curly gets hit, and there's one short, I think it might have been halfway to Holly, and you see the knives drop out of him. You know, a direct steal from Harpo. And there's another one, cut the cards, and Curly takes out an axe and cuts the cards. Harpo did that 15 years earlier in uh, in um, uh, Horse Feathers. This is the ultimate analysis is the Three Stooges would steal from the Marx Brothers, but the Marx Brothers would never steal from the Three Stooges. The Marx Brothers were kind of at a higher level. They were more erudite, they were more intellectual. It was just like a higher level of comedy. The similarities are there, and they've both held up through time. These, remember, these comedies are like 90 or almost 100 years old, and they still held up. They're still hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, I do like the Three Stooges, and, and I agree that, that, that Curly is a very 
very gifted uh, and often surprising sort of magical performer. Um, yes. the, the big difference that I just can't get past, though, of course, is is like like most comedy teams that the, the Three Stooges are are under the heel of the world. They're not they don't dominate. You know, they're, they're hobos or they're plumbers or something and they turn up and they wreck the place and they get chased away and they get they get thrown in jail. And, and you know, they're, they're, they the Marx Brothers are much more confrontational and, and, and they win. And that's an enormous part of the difference and an enormous part of their appeal, I think. Excellent analysis. I never thought that's brilliant, Matthew. Excellent call. <laughs> Another thing you have to take into consideration is that what the Stooges were putting out was basically product, you know, the shorts. The, mm-hmm. They were just cranking them out. Uh, the Marxes, uh, however, you know, were taking a year to nurture each film to make it as good as they could do it. Uh, if the Stooges were given that opportunity, we might have a totally different perspective. Mm-hmm. Good point. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're certainly talented and they're certainly funny. They, if they, you know, if they'd been right. given absolutely crackerjack scripts, I'm sure they would have, you know, done them justice. Yeah. And to again quote myself, and a lot of people think I'm joking, but I'm serious about this. I think Go West would have been a much better vehicle for the Stooges than it was for the Marxes. That's an interesting point. Yeah, good point. I was surprised to find when I was researching uh, Herman Timberg, who had written for the Marx Brothers in vaudeville, um, and he was a comedy superstar in the vaudeville years, and then later he became a sort of writer and producer and nurturer of other comedians' work, and that in the 1940s, when the Marx Brothers were pretty much finished with their career as a team, uh, Larry Fine was trying to get Herman Timberg to write for the Stooges yes. and to craft vehicles for them, uh, specifically because he's quoted in his brother's book as saying he had hoped that Herman Timberg could turn the Stooges into successors to the Marx Brothers, wow. and, which I thought was a little bit, it's kind of bittersweet in a way that at that point in the 1940s, the Stooges would still be in this aspirational state of kind of trying to chase the rabbit of mm. the Marx Brothers' career. That's so interesting. I never, I never knew that. Okay. Huh. And we shouldn't dismiss the fact that, you know, due to their TV exposure, you know, almost every day with the shorts, the Stooges were the portal to old time comedy for so many of us. You know, much yeah. more than the Marxes, who a lot of us discovered later on. Right. The Three Studios had yes. 200 shorts, whereas the Marx Brothers gave us 13 gems. You know, I mean, some gems, some lesser gems, but you have 13 things to hold on to. I've noticed that, that the Stooges, because over here, they, they, they didn't have that, that ubiquitous presence on, on mm-hmm. television uh, to anything like the same extent. They, the, the people that do like them tend to be more kind of connoisseurs of them over here because you've had we have to seek them out the way that we would you know harry langdon or right. or, or, or somebody like that interesting you know? so that that very very wide popularity you know like um you know sam from cheers is a big stooges fan you know there would never be an equivalent to that <laughs> right I've, I've never heard three stooges and connoisseurs in the same right. yeah. <laughs> another interesting one i heard matthew i kind of want to digress to this, but matthew, I, I had two landlords who were from england and then we were talking about benny hill and the, you know i regard him as a yeah. great piece and they said benny hill was looked on as a lower class guy in england he kind of looked down on him was that true Yes. It, well, well. Unfortunately, um, he, he he ended up being used really as a kind of a symbol for an old a, a type of old comedy that has elements in it that were felt to be uh, woefully outdated. Right. Um, when when the when alternative comedy became very very mm-hmm. big about 1982 over mm-hmm. here, um, unfortunately uh, Benny Hill became kind of the, the the totem for the for the old type of comedy and and he was he was treated very shabbily actually right. he, his his last years were, were you know were not mm-hmm. joyous yeah. for him yeah um, he was a genius I, I, he was brilliant I personally um, you know thought that was that was pretty shabby mm-hmm. but but um but yes he, he was he was just felt to have been what they were reacting against you know, you're talking about political correctness basically es- essentially yeah it was yeah it was it was the the idea was that uh you know he, he chased girls around in parks you know he ripped off people's dresses that kind mm-hmm. of stuff was was just was was not was it was out of date right. now yeah um, and rather than saying, you know, all of that stuff is out of date, um, for some reason, people tended to just sort of use him as the as the the instant. Yeah, you, you can't find him anywhere now, Matthew. He used to be like, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Benny Hill was on all over the place. But now you, you can't yeah. find him anywhere. 
And I, I do consider him. Yeah, I mean, he was always hugely popular with with viewers. Right. I mean, right, right to the end, he he his viewing figures. Right. Was, yeah. But uh, it was it became a really sort of ghettoized right. thing. You you were you know you were one or the other. It was really. Uh, is there any? I'm I'm just I don't even have this written down. I'm asking you guys this. Is there any marked others? backlash on like harpo chasing blondes or any of that i think there would be if they had a bigger profile but but they're they're kind of under the radar aren't they oh it's coming unfortunately i have no doubt that it's coming uh particularly on college campuses uh, could you believe it and i think a day at the races is, is in trouble too for uh totally different reasons if you know what i mean my last question is just this is just a brief one are there any existing pictures of miss flatto Harpo's second grade teacher when he got thrown out the window. Are there any pictures we have of Miss Flatto where I can actually see her? I always wondered what she looked like. I have one right here. <laughs> no, oh, no, I <laughs> I'm not aware of a picture of Miss Flatto, but I can see her in my mind, can't you? Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, why don't we move on to the main event here? We're going to have you rank all the Marx Brothers films. Okay. And I'll tell you what, let's do this differently than how people normally do it. We're going to start at the top and have you go from top to bottom. Do it that way. Absolutely. So, you ready? Okay. So, drum roll, please. Eddie Deason, what is your favorite Marx Brothers film? My favorite is mm-hmm. easy. It's slam dunk. It's humorous. I love Harpo is watching oh. the bad guy. Goes, and I love when Gunther goes off with a ball and chain on his leg. I love it. It kills me. I've seen it 50 <laughs> or 60 times, and I love this movie. No, okay. You, you did the uh, DVD commentary for yes, Humorist. Yes, exactly. You? Uh, you were great. <laughs> <laughs> Remember how primitive it was when we all bought, all of us kids bought Joe Adamson's book. And, it, mm. you know, nowadays, Humorist, it, you know, we all know it's common. Qu- Joe Adamson is, book. did you know the Marx Brothers made a silent film? What? And then, you know, I read Joe made this discovery, you know, that they did indeed make a silent film in 1920 where there any rates about it. Are you kidding? Simpson is so seminal. He's so important to the Marx Brothers. His knowledge is so important to all of us. And to Marx Brothers lore, he's so important to everything. I mean, I flip. I'll make a comment on your page and I'll see yeah. Joe Adamson will reply. Like, Joe freaking Adamson. <laughs> <laughs> like, literally, this is like going to Michael Jordan and asking about basketball or something. It's like going to Hugh Hefner yep. and asking about women. You know, you're going to get some <laughs> insights here. You know? And Joe Adamson, I, I consider the holy ground. My favorite two are this far apart. The first one would be Horse Feathers, which I yeah. love. I love everything about it. Uh, notwithstanding, of course, the horrible top scene in the middle where they're in Elma right. Pod's boudoir, and I, see, I hate that part. It's like, why don't you throw acid on the Sistine Chapel, you know? It's like, how can you ruin a beautiful <laughs> film like that? It's so wonderful. <laughs> what kind of funny antics would they have had in that room, that scene? It would have been I, I totally agree, Eddie. Yeah. I can totally relate to that. You know, just, just the knowledge that it's coming up in the film affects the entire experience for me. Yes. I can't explain it. Maybe it's because I'm in the business or something, but it, it just drives me crazy. Totally agree, Bob. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. It's like this great masterpiece. And they, they did that. whoever butchered it like that, I, I never forgive him. My favorite Groucho scene is, like my dad said, that the scene where he's dancing with the professors, my favorite Groucho scene of all time. I watch it on YouTube all the time. Whenever I feel down, I'll go to YouTube. And I just play Groucho, horse feathers, dance. And I'll watch that scene over and over. It's Groucho in his prime. He does these moves. Where he swings his legs around. My only small caveat the one yeah. professor in the middle keeps reading all through it. He's reading. And I found that a little distracting. I didn't necessarily like it. If I was a director, I would have said, no, just be all the professors listening to Groucho. But they thought it would be funny if the one professor kept reading all through the routine. And I didn't like that part. But I love the professors go around in a circle. And Groucho climbs on the table and he does these hilarious moves. There was a great book I read when I was a kid. It was called The Great Comedians Talk Comedy. And Woody Allen made this observation. It's true to this day. And it's so spot on. He goes... Groucho Marx was the only consummate comedian we've ever had in history. He, goes, he looked funny. He walked funny. He danced funny. He talked funny. He wrote funny. The contents of what he said was funny. He wore funny outfits. Even his name was funny. Everything about this guy's funny. And Groucho was probably the greatest comedy of, of, outside of all his great verbal abilities and his sight gags. He was the funniest comedy dancer of all time. His dancing moves are brilliant. He's like Fred Astaire. It's funny. It's somehow funny. My favorite Chico number is in uh, Porch Feathers with Elma Todd, that wonderful number. And it's as close as we'll ever see, again, to Chico with a woman and his effect. On, you watch Elma Todd's face, in that scene. she's absolutely in ecstasy. She's in heaven. And yeah. you just know after the scene, Chico and her probably went to the dressing room and shook. You know, you just, <laughs> this is Chico. And you just see, this is the effect guy. And you see it in Elma Todd's <laughs> face. It's like this radiance of joy. And you see her look close. And she kind of pinches Chico there. And it's a beautiful song. I love that scene. Everything. I love the football scene, of course. 
the the classroom scene is probably the closest we'll see to the Marx Brothers in vaudeville. It's probably that was probably fun in high school or whatever, and they probably lifted a lot of guys. And that's probably what the Marx Brothers looked like twenty years ago when they were doing you know their their schoolroom scene, you know, on the on the vaudeville circuit. They probably took a lot of those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, every facet of Horse Feathers has, has been my favorite. It was my favorite when I first started liking the Marx Brothers forty five years ago, and it's my favorite to this day. So that's one A and one B. 1A and 1B, these are so close. It's like, it's like, who was the better person? Albert Einstein or Martin Luther King Jr.? But I'm going to go with my number two. just like that. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, I'm stretching the analogies. My number two (laughs) is so close is Monkey Business. Now, this is a film where I saw Groucho as a genius. This is where I go, we're dealing with something more than a comedian here. The scene where they're in the costume party and Groucho's there with the Native American, the guy's dressed as an Indian. And Groucho goes, well, if you don't like this country, why don't you go back where you came from? And I, it's almost, sometimes you don't even laugh. It's kind of like you see Michelangelo or something, Michelangelo or Da Vinci. And I go, that line is so clever. He says this to a Native American. He's saying, if you don't like this country, why don't you go back to where you came from? <laughs> it was so beyond laughter. And I go, this is Groucho Marx. He's so beyond, he's so far above other comedians. He's such a genius. And that line hit me so hard. I go, only a real genius could have delivered a line like that. That really hit me in that one. The Marx Brothers running on deck. My all-time favorite movie is A Hard Day's Night with the Beatles. I always thought this was a, a eerie precursor, the Beatles running down at the beginning of A Hard Day's Night, the Marx Brothers running on the ship. I see, it's so electrifying and so exhilarating. Uh, you know, every, every Marx person has their favorite scenes. For me, I thought the, the puppet scene was Harpo's finest moment on film. I, did, I worshiped that scene. I thought, it, this is so brilliantly clever. He turns around, he's, he's the puppet face with a cookie, you know, and... I, I loved everything about that scene, but I, and I, I listened to your podcast and you guys were rather dismissive. <laughs> you know, again, it's, it's all subjective. It's all taste. You know, uh, this is what really? I always say. I, I used this to is what it. I always say. Mr. Diamond Saga. On also, that. isn't it true that that's such a good point that like, even when there's, even in their greatest movies, there's a scene here and there where you'd say, well, that's not my favorite for the right. following reasons. But it took like 50 viewings to realize that. Yes, like, uh, yeah. On the first viewing, I didn't think, uh, gee, this isn't quite in character for Harpo. Right. <laughs> you know, I, all I thought was, uh, I'm in heaven watching the Marx Brothers. Exactly. Totally. I totally understand. The Chevalier number. Chico has one of my favorite Chico lines. Is that a picture of you? And he goes, that's not like me. It doesn't look like me from the front. I go to the back of the ship and it looks just like me. <laughs> that line is so brilliant. That line is worthy of Groucho or any comedian. That's maybe Chico's funniest line, but it's so clever. I love that scene. Uh, I love all the stuff at the old barn. Uh, is, again, as you guys talked about again in the Zeppo podcast, Zeppo misses him on the punch. It's the worst punch in movie history. <laughs> like a but for some reason, Norman McLeod or whoever was the director left that in and they didn't reshoot it. Which is just so ironic because as we've mentioned before, he was he was in so many real life brawls. He, yes, I, I got that in your broadcast. He was like a, a bit of a hood, a bit of a thug and he knew how to fight. But yeah, that was weird how that worked out that way. They just left that scene in. It might, might have been a bad, bad script editing, or maybe they were in a hurry or whatever. I don't know. Oh, yeah. And another thing I love, monkey business. Okay, the scene where the, right when they're coming to the old barn, Groucho and Chico, and the guy, the thug upstairs, goes, scram, or we get away, and he throws the bale of hay down. Now, watch closely the first time. You'll see Chico kind of push Groucho back. We'll hold him in his chest. We'll push him back. It, that's obviously not in the script. It was just that. I always thought that was... Leonard Marx is looking out for his kid brother Julius. Like, we're in the car with our moms, you know, driving the, the, the brake screech, and your mom puts her arm out, you know, to watch the kid. I don't want my kid to go through the window. And I always thought that was a sweet scene. That's Leonard Marx making sure Julius doesn't get hit by this bale of hay coming up. I thought I thought that was a sweet little touch. Well, that's nice, yeah. I agree with you, actually, Eddie, about about one specific thing there. I don't put those two films at the top of my list as you do. Right. But, I, but what I do is find them very, very hard to choose between. And I usually have those yeah. two films as my joint third. Um, I think my Monkey Business has probably got my favourite bits in it of the two, particularly the Chevalier mm-hmm. scene. But I right. would probably say that, that Horse Feathers, of all their films, has probably got the highest laugh-to-minute ratio. I mean, it's yes. just funny, yeah. funny, 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 all right. the way exactly. through. Right. And so I, I do find it very hard to choose between those two, and I usually place them at joint third. Yeah. 
they're usually like, as every Marx Brothers fan knows, the first five, the Paramount films, were going between different levels of greatness, different levels of genius, different levels of yeah. brilliance. Whereas the later films, different levels of mediocrity. You know, these are these are mediocre. This is less mediocre than that one. And after all, it is the Marx Brothers. You know, it's kind of we're at a way more bargain basement level. But they're yeah, they're, they're kind of interchanged. And almost any Marx Brothers fan worth the salt, it, it's those five Paramounts. This is the Mount Everest, the Marx Brothers. They weren't watered down. You know, we, we had. You know, we had Elvis, and then he goes in the army, and they cut up the cybers, and he doesn't shake him. They watered him down. And the Marx Brothers gradually went through that metamorphosis. They were like, free and easy. Let's just put him in front of the camera. Let him do their thing. And then we get the Allberg film. So, okay, well, let's make him appealing to women. You know, let's make him later, and let's put in a more advanced number. Let's have more romance. And then they goes weaker, and then they get weaker and weaker towards the end. It, just, it kind of went on a dwindling spiral, particularly with Chico. Particularly with Chico, who's great in the first seven, and then the last six, he's like, he doesn't do hardly anything funny at all. Well, he has to carry the plot because they become yeah. so plot heavy. He was like the uh, the tie in with the with the real world because right. you know Harpo certainly, certainly couldn't be. So Chico was the one at the beginning of the films who was with the the love the love interest, and he would bring Groucho in. So right. he had a, he served a function which was totally different than what he had at Paramount. Another moment I love is where Chico goes, where they're in the barn, and the guy's coming at him with the pitch right. He goes, thought you had us, didn't you? Thought you were going to get us, didn't you? He totally breaks character. He's like, Chico, you're not Italian anymore. What is that? Like, that scene is just so, so hilarious. And I always thought that was like Leonard Marks going back to the streets in New York. You know, he's like, they were all running through these rough streets. And Chico, that's probably how Leonard Marks talked, you know, when he was 14. Mm -hmm. Oh, you thought you had us, didn't you? And he's like pawning this other gang or whatever. Also, I, I didn't know, when I saw these two, I didn't know the Thelma Todd story. She's a tragic blonde, you know, or, or horrible end, murder and all. I didn't know that. And when I see her, there's a small bit of sadness. Like, kind of like when we see Marilyn Monroe. We all see her now, you know, you know what ultimately was the half of this beautiful girl. And Mark Spurs had two of those tragic blondes in their films. And when I see them, I'll, it'll kind of always be in the back of my mind what their ultimate destiny was after being with the Marx Brothers. Yeah, just like Margaret Dumont, I can imagine Thelma becoming you know, a staple in their films. Yeah, she was just in those two, right. I mean, she easily could have been Flo in A Day at the Races. Good point. She could easily have been Flo. You're right. Excellent point. Yeah. Okay, and your next film? Next on my list is Animal Crackers, which is the Marsh recipe. It, it's a, a little bit dated, just a small bit. For instance, the, the Harpo comes out and they rip his shirt off and he's got the T-shirt on. Now, in 1930, this was probably a shock. Oh, my God, look, he's got a T-shirt. <laughs> Nowadays, it's like, it's not funny. It's not really funny. It's like ho-hum. You know, he's got a T-shirt and shorts on. Nowadays, you would probably have him naked. You know, if, we, if the animal yeah. made out the shock, they would probably have Harpo naked. And, uh, oh, my God, that was probably the effect it had in the 30s. And I'm sure he'd have been happy to do that, too. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that. I wrote an article, you can Google it on Google it on the internet, it's called Harpo Marks Naked. And I wrote how, how many things Harpo Marks, he was like this child, he was like a man-child, and all this nakedness follows through his whole life. And it's, but that's another subject. But anyway. Wait, 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 wait. Everybody's Googling. Hold on a second. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everybody back now? Okay, you're good to go. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, in, in Joe Adamson's book, there's that story about Harpo dressing in a hurry for a, a performance of Animal Crackers, and uh, who knows how apocryphal this is, but actually being naked or, yes. or nearly naked yeah. under the coat, and the actors who were so good at registering fake surprise were then in genuine shock <laughs> yes. to see him in yeah. something. And and Groucho's immortal ad lib was, tomorrow he's not wearing anything, so That's, catch your yes. tickets early. Perfect, <laughs> yes. Animal crackers, they're all at their peak. Groucho, I love his dance. I love the Captain Spawn. Oh, yeah, here's a question I had for you guys. When they're doing, Chico's doing his piano number, okay? And then Harpo takes over and plays for a little while. Now, is he playing Waltz Me Around Willie really and Love Me and the World Is Mine? Is, is he playing one of those two songs? When he, what does Harpo play there? Yeah, well, isn't it... Uh, da, 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 bum, bum, bum. No, that's No, he goes... It's a little tune, it's a little melody, but I don't know what the melody is. And I always wonder, was that the one? Because he, he says it in Harpo Speaks. Oh, yeah. the one that intersperses with slapping his leg, that that thing. That, yes, that exactly, yeah. exactly, where he yeah. slaps his leg, yeah. He plays them both well, yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm not sure what it is, but okay. I don't think it's either of those two. Okay, okay. Oh, waltz me around again, Willie, or, or love me and the world is mine. Right, okay. Um, Animal Crackers, oh yeah, his, 
I, everything worked in it. I loved it so much. Um, I, the end is so beautiful and special. Harper, where he puts the woman to sleep, you know, with the, with the spritzer, he spritz on everybody around. And I, Harper was interesting. He chased the blondes around. He chased the women. And of course, nowadays, this would be looked on as sexist, you know, Harper's sexist, demeaning to women, you know, blah, blah, blah. Groucho makes an interesting quote. I think it was in the, the Groucho file. He goes, Harpo chased women, but he never knew what to do with them when he caught them. And that, that's how I see the Harpo character. I think it's like mm. a, you give a little baby a shiny penny or a sh anything shiny, and the baby's fascinated. And I think Harpo was like that with women. You see, women are the most beautiful creatures in the universe. We all know that. And Harpo's seeing this beautiful thing walking around, and he just impulsively chased her. I, you know, he, he wasn't like Chico. Chico went to bed him down. I don't think that was even in Harpo's mind. He's just chasing this beautiful aesthetic thing. And if he caught him, I don't know what he would have done with him. I don't think he would have taken him to his dressing room. But that's how I always got the impression of Harpo with women. Yeah. One of the reasons why that film's my favourite, though, is is because I do think they are at their most dangerous seeming in that film. Things right. like horse feathers, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're in a situation that they couldn't possibly be in in reality. You know, Groucho could never actually be the president of that college. And so it just gives it just a slight edge of fantasy. Whereas in Animal Crackers, you know, they're turning up at a realistic sort of party. The other characters are basically realistic and, and they have a genuinely antagonistic, dangerous quality quality to them. I'm particularly right. uh, thinking thinking of Harpo's scene with Mrs. Whitehead where uh, he flirts with her and then as soon as she responds to him he goes to break her arm. Yeah. You know that yeah, that, yeah. that kind of they've got a real yeah. edge in that film that that, uh, right. that that's partly why it's my favorite one. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a wonderful brilliant film. I love the the, the scene with uh uh, was he Jemison, I guess, in that film? Uh, Hunga Dunga, Hunga Dunga, and McCormick. Put in quotes, unquote. I can't even quote, but <laughs> Groucho's dialogue in that is so brilliant. And, I, and, and Zeppo is a very able straight man there. He kind of carries on as a perfect straight man. Zeppo, again, ostensibly the funniest one in real life. What would he have done if he'd been in the act? And it might have been just too much. It might, we have these three brilliant comedians, these three comedic genius. If they had a fourth, even if he did have a great character, might it have been too much? It might have been too much to cram four of these guys in the same movie. It might have been mm. just overkill. So we had to have this guy like that. I, that's all I can figure about it. Have you got the Blu-rays, Eddie? Where they because there's ec now extra restored lines to that hunger dogger scene. No, I, I do not have. No, I, I should see that. Okay, okay. I saw the extra stuff in Love Happy. I've seen the extra. It's kind of funny. It's yeah. interesting to see the discarded stuff. It's, it's obviously it's all treasures with these guys. It's like the Beatles. You know, any outtake. We want to hear, oh, they made an outtake at Strawberry Fields in 1968 where John was on the beach. And, you know, you want to hear it as a Beatles. You want to hear everything. Zeppo's, uh, Zeppo's scratch Elsie uh, bit is back, which is this phrase that I, n I never knew what it meant. There, there's posters for, I think it's monkey business, actually. Uh, I may be wrong, but there's a, there's a poster where they've each got speech bubbles and, and, and Zeppo's speech oh. bubble is saying scratch Elsie. And I never knew what that meant, but it's, right. it's a deleted, uh, you know, a censored line from the hunger dunger scene, which is now back oh. in, in the Blu-ray. So it is worth, uh, worth investing in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I love Animal Crackers. I saw it four nights in a row. The only two movies I've ever done it for in history. There was a there was a Charlie Chaplin documentary called Gentleman Tramp. And when I was living in LA, I went to that four nights in a row. I was so fascinated by it. But it's hard to, you know, and even your favorite movie, something you love, it's hard to see it four nights in a row. But Animal Crackers, I was never bored. All four screenings I was there, and then my family had to come over from New York. I would have probably gone to it five or six times in a row, but we were only there four nights, so I saw it every night. And that was the very first time you saw the film, was with a, with a huge audience. Yes, that I was mean, the that, first that's... time. It came on TV, I think, like 1980, a couple of years later. This was like the mid-70s. Yeah. It, yeah, it's just so exhilarating to sit in a theater with Marx Brothers fans, hardcore Marx Brothers fans, and see this great film that basically nobody had seen before. Everybody didn't know the lines backwards and forwards. Right. It really was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. That, you know, nobody's ever going to have that again. Absolutely right. Absolutely. You know, a part of what's so much fun about the Blu-ray restoration that Matthew is talking about is Animal Crackers has like an additional roughly two minutes in it that's sprinkled throughout the film. And it's all stuff that was cut because it was a little too blue or risque for the time. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously very tame now. Yes. But it's, it's so interesting to watch Animal Crackers and hear jokes you're not familiar with mm. that, are, that are just slightly over the line. Lillian Roth says, uh, I've been looking for you all morning. And Chico says, I was busy this morning, but you could have had me last night. <laughs> right. Yeah. Duck Soup was next on my list. This was, according to Susan, it was Harpo's favorite. Groucho cited his favorite. He would call it the war picture. 
Uh, I, it's a great movie. Unequivocally, I can't critique anything bad in it. I can't say anything bad. I just never warmed up to it in the way I could warm up to the others. For some reason, I just embraced these other three. Duck Soup, it, it, a little more sterile for me. I don't know. It, it didn't have the warmth of the others. I don't know why. But I do love it. Now, here's a question I'll ask you guys. I honestly don't know. I have read in books that the, the final number was ad lib. As hard as that is to believe, there was no script for it. And they just went up and everybody... Now, I find it hard to believe, you know, they all get down and they all kick their legs up together. How could that have possibly been ad-libbed? How could that have been made up when it was so nicely choreographed? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly, you know, what you're referring to, because, you know, that was probably the most choreographed thing the Marxists were ever in. Right. At least at Paramount. But I, I do love it. I love that scene. I love... Uh, um, oh, yes, I love... You were talking on your show about Zeppo. And his last, Zeppo's last time speaking, oh, how we cry for fly, 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 <laughs> should die. I always thought that was kind of Zeppo saying his goodbye. He's like, Why does he cry in that scene? I always thought that was Zeppo saying goodbye. I'm, he's crying and he's saying, this is the end of my film, Chris. The last thing I'm ever going to be put through. And I'm going to say, that was it. <laughs> oh, of course, the mirror scene. What can you say? I mean, it, absolutely. Maybe you could justify to say this is the funniest scene in the history of the movie. You could say that. Now, maybe it is, maybe it is, but you could say that and people wouldn't say that's a stupid thing to say. That's It's a viable scene. It's that good. See, told you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what's after Duck Soup, Eddie? My next one is, well, the big five, the last one left is Coconuts, which I love again. Yeah. I love Coconuts. Obviously, for obvious reasons, it's the most dated of the Marx Brothers film, simply because it looks so primitive. It just looks like it's, it was not made a hundred years ago. It looks like it's made like 500 years ago. Chico's makeup looks kind of weird. He has almost an effeminate makeup on. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I got laughs and I do love the movie, but just the production values, it looks so old and dated. But on the other hand, it's a thrill to see that this is our first contact with the Marx Brothers. My God, this is it. You know, it, it's like, as Joe Adamson pointed out so well in his book, we're seeing these guys, Chico, the first time Chico's 42, Harpo is 40, and God, sorry, these are middle-aged men. We never saw, you know, Mr. Green's reception. We never saw school days or, you know, anything, you know, Mr. Green's voyage or whatever those were all called. We never saw these guys. We missed, like, 20 years of these brilliant guys. We've never seen them, which I'm going to digress real quick. I know it's a marker. Nice. I'm just going to digress real quick. The four great acts in history, let's say we had the uh, hypothetical time machine. You can go back in time machine and go to any moment in history. These are the four acts. We all want to go back and we'll never see them. One. Elvis, Elvis in the 50s, seeing Elvis on stage in the 50s, shaking around. He doesn't quite capture any of them. Can you imagine what it must be like to see Elvis in the 50s shaking up every song with the sideburns and the audience going crazy? That would be one. Two, the Beatles, both incarnations. We see Pete Best at Hamburg with the Beatles, the early days, before they were the Fab Four, to see Pete Best. You know, they were literally on stage for eight hours. These guys are on stage performing for eight hours. Are you serious? You know, this is the primitive Beatles. You want to see that? And also, just the trip to see the Beatles with Ringo. They would go on stage and do a concert. They were like on stage for like 30 or 40 minutes. You couldn't hear a word, you know, just, just like these guys. Went. Just the experience of seeing the Beatles on stage must have been incredible sight. So that would be the number two. Number three, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis in a nightclub, in a club. Every person I've ever talked to that saw Dean and Jerry in a club, they go, you had to see him in a club. You go, the movies are great. I, love, I know the movies are good. They're funny. They're wonderful. But Martin and Lewis in a club... They're so much better than the movies. They are never captured. And, and, you know, nowadays, of course, we have them on YouTube. We see Dean and Jerry, YouTube, they're at the Copacabana. But we don't have that record. What kind of magic they must be, you know, Jerry dropping dishes and, you know, chasing around through the audience. It must yeah, be incredible. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then the fourth one, of course, is the Marx Brothers in vaudeville or on Broadway. Alsatia's. Can we see Alsatia's? You know, whenever we, we, we get an idea of uh, animal packers and uh, coconuts from that. But we never see Alsatias or any of the other wonderful stuff. We kind of get a view in horse feathers. You know, the horse feathers you can see was Mr. Green's thing, was, you know, Groucho doing his thing, and uh, Kiko and Harper were students in his class. We kind of see that in horse feathers. Wait a minute. You left out an act. What do you mean? Rowan and Martin. Come on. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. How can I miss that? <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I trade in my tickets for the first three and just have four tickets to the Marx yeah, Brothers? No, I understand your viewpoint. I understand. <laughs> you're just Matthew. You're just the Marx Brothers fanatic. You're not into other stuff. Um, I'm, I do like other things, but but I'm I'm not a big fan of uh, of any of those other three acts. I'm afraid. Understood. As we talk about on your page, one of the great Facebook comment pages is, 
how comedy is subjective. They're actually, you know, it's hard to believe that there are people walking the streets who don't think Marx Brothers are funny. And you go, what? Are you sick or something? You know, these are the funniest guys that ever lived. <laughs> and the same with me with the Three Stooges. You know, there's some people that don't think Three Stooges. But it's all subjective. It's all just how you see it. Okay, so what's next on the list? Okay, my next one. This is probably my most controversial choice because the next two logical choices are, of course, opera graces. But I, this is my own personal choice. I love A Night in Casablanca. It came late in their career, but, and they look a little old. Harper looks kind of weird with his hair that way. Yeah, I hadn't noticed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, it might not even be as funny as Races or Opera, but I just love everything about the movie. I, for me, it works all the way. The opening gag, Harpo holding up the wall, you know, the Frank Tashlin gag. Oh, what do you think you're doing? Hold up on the wall falls down. I thought he was, Harpo was brilliant. Sig room, and you'll never find a better foil for Harpo. You know, I'll see you, Schweinman. It's, it's hilarious seeing the scenes with him and Harpo. And Harpo goes down and he shoots the dice, and Harpo has the catcher's outfit on. Harpo never let us down. You know, he was always great. He was great in it. Uh, Chico, of course, was, was pretty dead in this time. The, the checkered camel. I mean, none of that's the worst. I love the scene, though, with Chico and Harpo <laughs> in the casino. We got to save something for a rainy day. And Harpo pulls out the umbrella. That, that's a funny sight, mm -hmm. guy. I, I love that. With the chips in his eyes, I love that. It's a joyous film for me. It's one where I will get it and I'll, I won't want to go to the bathroom. You know, I'll go to the bathroom. Whereas races and opera, I'll go to the bathroom. I don't mind. I'll go, okay. It's the, it's the water scene. I'll go to the bathroom. You know. But I, it's just a treasured scene to me. I don't know why. It's very but interesting. Go, West, you go to the bathroom and don't come out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting that in Harpo's speech, his autobiography, Harpo does not mention Love Happy. He says, we did our final film, Night in Casablanca. He doesn't mention it which is incredible, but I guess he had affinity for this film too in a way and he didn't have it for Love Happier. He just wanted to forget it. Hmm. I know this is a long shot, but I wonder if this was because he didn't consider Love Happy a team film. He thought of it as a solo film in his own head, the way you know, the way it was conceived and most of the time shooting it. It was his film, not a team film. Yeah, that's a good theory, Bob. You might be right. Maybe it's as simple as that. But you know, in his autobiography, he still should have mentioned it though. Even though he didn't think it was a Mark Brothers film, he goes, well, you know, I did this movie. You know, I mean, anybody else, you're the star of a movie. You know, it's totally a Harpo film. He, he didn't even mention it. So you have to think he wasn't happy with it. You'd have to think that, wouldn't you? Yeah. He didn't like the results of it. Yeah, definitely. It's the case, I think. Yeah, he had, yeah. He had very bitter, bittersweet memories of it. Yeah. Right. Although, I mean, it's, it's, it's a homage to Harpo almost, the film. Well, we'll get to it later down the list. But anyway, my next is, of course, the ostensibly greatest Mark Brothers film, A Night at the Opera which I do love, and it's a great movie, but I, I never warmed up to like the others. We're going down the list. They were all funny in it. I thought they were all great. Uh, the contract scene was great. I thought, that, oh, yeah, I think Dicko's most brilliant scene, this is just for me as a, as a fan, was his pilot scene, where they're the pilots that he got, you know, we came, we flew in, and we got one foot from the ground, and we had to fly back. I thought that was an absolute brilliant piece of comedy. I thought it was worthy of anything Groucho's ever done. That was Chico at his finest as a comedian. I thought he was just working alone, and I think it's hysterical from beginning to end. I even like the beginning of the vision where Chico wipes his beard. He has his beard, and he wipes his mouth. He has sips the water, and he wipes his mouth. <laughs> that was a cute little Chaplin-esque gag. So I, I, I love that. Um, I, oh, yeah, here's a question I wanted to ask you guys. Does Harpo really drink all that water in that scene, or is that trick photography? He drinks like five glasses. How did he possibly do that? It's a trick glass. If you look very closely, you can see that the the inside of the glass slopes inwards so that there's only a very small space inside. Oh, okay. Very you can, good. You, you, can, you can actually see it if you look very closely on a good print. Excellent. Mm. Thank you, Matthew. I never knew that all these years, <laughs> so that answers that question. It's, um, let's see. <laughs> What else? I love that scene. I love, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I always thought Chico, the scene where they're in the room, you know, having the breakfast, and Harpo cuts off Chico's tie. And then he cuts up, right. and you hear Chico laugh there. And there's something authentic about it. I always thought Chico was really breaking up. He's like, Harpo's a funny guy, and he cuts off, and Chico laughs really sincerely. <laughs> there's something real about it. And I always thought that was a real laugh yeah. as opposed to a laugh in the script. That's just my own view. Yeah, you could tell this was the kind of setup where Harper was doing different things each take. Exactly. And, you know, this particular bit set Chico off. Yeah. I think I heard in one of your podcasts where they just go, in the script, you just go, Harper does funny business or Harper does, because you couldn't script him the way you could talk to Chico. I'll tell you a beautiful Three Stooges story, getting to Curly. A lot of times in the Three Stooges scenes, they were, Jules White was their big director. And Jules White, they have a scene they didn't know what to do there. And every time Jules White would come up to Curly and he'd go, look, we don't have anything to do here. You do whatever you want. I know you'll be great. 
And he said that every time. He'd always go, I know you'll be great. And Curly, like Harpo, he never let him down. Curly would just come up, you know, he'd spin on the floor or he'd do, yeah, whatever. He'd come up with something great every time. And it's such a beautiful, huge story. Curly and Harpo had this capacity to just turn out these brilliant gags. They just, they just churned them out and they had the ability to do that. You know, mm-hmm. we're dealing with genius here, you know? Imagine the pressure, too. I mean, you get to the set to work. Right. Groucho, every brilliant thing Groucho's going to say is on paper, has right. been argued about, yes. collaborated right. on, honed to perfection. And Harpo, it's like, eh, do something funny here. Right. Exactly right. You're right. I wonder if they ever went to Zeppo with the same uh, direction. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Do something funny here. And they were severely disappointed every time. Yeah. 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 Zeppo yes. does something <laughs> funny. Yeah. <laughs> Or they say, hey, Zeppo, could you do something not funny here? <laughs> right. <laughs> and Zeppo, never let him down. Never let him down. Try not to be noticeable. <laughs> right, exactly. you, can always, exactly. you can always tell a Milford man. There's a really lovely story about, uh, a, 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 I don't know if you know, a British comic actor called Sid James. Sidney I don't know James. him. Um, but he, he um, there's, there's a story about him where he was doing a situation comedy series called uh, Bless This House, which was a big successful sitcom for him. But um, at the end of... When they were rehearsing the very first episode, the producer, William D. Stewart, took him to one side and said, look, I'm, I'm sorry, Sid, I don't want to, you know, I appreciate I'm a nobody and you're, you're Sid James, but this isn't funny. This, is, this isn't, there's something not working about this. And, and Sid James took him to one side and said, there's an old boxing expression. You don't leave your fight in the gym. He said, just wait, wait until we record. And if you're not happy with that, let me know but I don't leave my fight in the gym. Uh, and, and, and he said, you know, that's, that's how you know you've got an absolutely reliable comic talent that, that, that when it comes to the night, they will pull it out of the bag. And that's exactly what he did. And he said, you know, for the next six series, I never had to worry about him ever again. Uh, what a but great I, I story. Just, awesome story. I love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They had a similar one, Matthew, with uh, when they were filming Some Like It Hot. I read Tony Curtis autobiography. They would see Marilyn as Marilyn's getting directed by Billy Wilder. And Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon would watch. They go, this is so flat. They go, it doesn't work. And then, of course, they saw the rush and they saw this magic of Marilyn Monroe. But they couldn't see it at the time. It was something she conveyed to the camera that they had to, had to see it in the camera. You couldn't see yeah. it live there. They go, this is terrible. Billy's going to die. They go, Billy's crazy. They, that was their line. They go, Billy's crazy. He's photographing. And Marilyn Monroe, if you watch that film, she's hit perfect. She's impeccable. She's brilliant. She's funny. But you had to like see it there. And she knew how to put it out there. But you couldn't necessarily see it at that point. Yeah. Okay, my next is, of course, Day at the Races, which is, is almost as good as Night at the Opera. They're kind of interchangeable. But ruins it, of course, we all know the, the long production numbers. It, it, it just went on too long. It's like this flat space in between it. It just, it kind of kills a lot of the film. It kills kind of the fun of it. Um, here's a point nobody brings up. This isn't the worst part of any Marx Brothers film. Of course, there's the love interest, which is usually boring, especially with Kenny Baker, but we'll get to that. But isn't the worst part of any Marx Brothers film the harp solos? I don't know if anybody who's like, oh, I really love that harp. <laughs> I guess because we love Harpo so much, we just put up with it. And we see the joy it brings up. You can see the joy on Harpo's face. <laughs> But that's like, it's a, it's a really dead moment, but I've never thought that I'm going to turn this off. I always watch Fascinate. I'll look at Harpo, and he's such a fascinating guy. I guess we're always fascinated. We never get bored with it. I like them very much in the early films where he's playing like, like uh, you know, the, w- one of the tunes from the movie that I really like. Right. And he's doing a harp, harp version of it. In right. the later MGM ones where he's just doing more kind of generic pieces, I, I wonder more, yeah. I agree with Matthew on that. I enjoy the harp solos a lot more than I used to. Right. I mean, now I find them kind of magical and, um, you know, it seems to offer some insight into Harpo that you don't get during his comedy scenes. But I will admit, in my early encounters with the Marx Brothers, I used to fast forward all, Did you? all the harp solos mm-hmm. and, and the piano solos, too. I, oh, I really? I come to appreciate them later. Yeah, yeah. I, I can enjoy most of Chico's piano solos. I, again, the film with Todd was my favorite. That's one of my favorite parts of the whole movie. But I can usually, you know, I love the one with Harpo in the big store where they're together. And he, he, I don't know, he seems to be having such a good time. It kind of reminds me of Benny Hill. You watch Benny Hill and he has all these great guys. And then in every Benny Hill show, he'd sing a song. He'd sing a body song. And you look at his face and Benny Hill's eyes would like twinkle. And he had this big smile. And I go, this is where his heart really was. And I, you see what Chico playing the piano. He's really enjoying it. Mm. And with Harpo playing mm. the harp, it's like, there's this different aesthetic thing. I'm really having a great time here. I'm really enjoying myself. And I see that. Uh, and I, I, I've never been bored with a piano number. It, it's interesting. I, I see your viewpoint, Bella. But I, I've never got bored with Chico's, but I always enjoy his numbers. Well, at Paramount, the piano and harp solos are nice breaks from the 
wall-to-wall madness. But right. when you get to MGM, we have enough with the uh, plot scenes and the romantic interest where we don't need so many breaks. Right. So perhaps they're not as enjoyable there because we don't need so many, you know, intermissions, so to speak. Yeah, again, too too much of the thing. You notice, uh, and I'm sure you guys know, monkey business and duck suit, or monkey business and horse feathers, Groucho has little guitar bits. And, you know, apparently, Groucho didn't know how to play the card. Either. They just figured three numbers will be too much. Where, you know, he's going to get Groucho a guitar solo in there, you know, like, not like Jimi Hendrix, but just a guitar solo. <laughs> but it was probably just too much, you know. Three musical numbers, it's enough for Harpo and Chico. You get a sense him playing, and he's not bad. He's, dun, 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 I don't know. He just kind of struggles, but you can see he kind of likes playing the guitar. It's interesting, isn't it, that Groucho never insisted on that because we know that yeah. he absolutely loved he loved playing the guitar. Uh-huh. It was something that he really enjoyed. Right. And you know, the other two brothers have a musical spot. Right. You could almost imagine him saying, "I should have a guitar spot every time." He exactly. But it's interesting yeah. that he doesn't. Yeah. Well, he usually had a singing spot. You're right. He had yes, the singing yes. spot. No, good point. That was probably yeah. what it was. You're right. If he hadn't had that, you're right, he would have probably insisted on the guitar thing. Just to be equal. He was he was the star of the act. You can't you know, get away from that. Let's get to the pathos of uh, of opera and uh, races. They get Harpo's a sympathetic character. Uh, they try mm. to get pathos. You guys talked about on your wonderful podcast about that horrible scene where the beginning scene with Harpo in opera, where the guy's beating up Harpo, and then they close the door, and then Marino O'Sullivan comes out. Or, or, you know, who was it in, in the opera? Was Marino O'Sullivan? Who's the lady in that? Uh, Kitty, Kitty Carlisle. Carlisle. Kitty Carlisle. I'm sorry. She comes in and she's all oh, uh, stop it and that. And he goes, "Oh no, Harpo's my friend." And then she goes, and then you hear these sounds of him being beat in the dressing room, which was too much mm. for a comedy. It sounds like it's like out of a Boris Karloff movie. You know, you hear these. Sounds. And I always hated that. <laughs> and I cringe at it as a kid. I never liked that part. Groucho, as we all know, had a crush on uh, Marino Sullivan, and you can see like yeah. a softness in his character. And that's what, I suppose you'll think I'm an old fraud. Da, da, da. And he's like has this softer touch. He had a crush on. Woody Allen, I'm reading his autobiography now. He says he did a film with Marino Sullivan. And according to Woody Allen, yeah. this what he, he said Marino Sullivan said she had a crush on Groucho. She liked him, but she never went through with it. Now, if you hear Marino Sullivan interviewed like on Dick Cavett, and all this, she always says Groucho made approaches to me and had a crush, but I always said, no, I don't like funny men. I didn't, she didn't, she wasn't mm. attracted to him. But Woody Allen's book says she was indeed attracted to Groucho. There was some kind of attraction mm. going on there. So who do you believe? I don't know. Hmm. I guess they were both married, weren't they? So, so you know, it was a kind of a no-win situation. But I, right. there does seem, I, I agree with you, there is a, a very slight sense in those scenes of of a kind of an extra textual uh, something going on, isn't there? Yes, you can see it. And he, uh, Groucho admits it. He, he, he was so beautiful. He admits he was deeply in love. He had a huge crush on her. Okay, next down the list. Any of these three are kind of interchangeable. I don't necessarily have a favorite of words, but they're interchangeable. But I'm going to go with uh, my favorite is the, At the Circus. I love Eve Arden. She was my friend, so I get to see her. That was fun. Uh, the worst mm-hmm. opening, my least favorite opening, Marx Brothers number. It was written by a chimpanzee or something. I remember seeing the movie when I when I was a kid, <laughs> and I heard that theme song, and I go, "It's from like actually, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I go, "Did somebody actually get paid for writing this?" I go, "It's like it's the most pure out juvenile song ever. It's not attractive at all." And as you guys put out, I hated the letters. I hated the not trying to go I didn't like those crooked italic letters. Or it was just annoying. Definitely the worst leading man. He, he's effeminate. He, we used to say in the, before political facts in the script, would say, Faye. You go, your character is Faye. That meant, you know, Richard Simmons kind of, and he was that way. In other words, what I say is, of all the actors in Hollywood, out of all the guys that could be Liam, you pick Kenny Baker? It's like, what are you <laughs> thinking? It's almost like a bad joke. He's got to be the worst leading man in history. I think they tested lots of different actors, but he was the only one that couldn't tell a donut from a wedding ring. So Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, oh, yeah. Harpo's opening scene. I thought it was funny when I was a kid. He's got the tiger skin hanging. Now I, I heard some guy on a, on a comedy web page when he goes, that looks like a phallic symbol. That thing hanging from Harper's legs, it looks like a phallic symbol when he's coming. And I look and it does. I look at that scene all different. I go, oh my yeah. God, it looks like a phallic symbol dangling between Harper's legs. So I've, I've never looked at that scene. Doesn't it even like raise up at some point? It, yes, it you're right. right. You're yeah. right, No, and That could even be further. You can take the joke even further yeah. with that. Good point. Every so often in the in the in the code era, you get you get jokes which you know obviously to 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 sane people uh, they're perfectly justifiable. But knowing how pedantic and how neurotic the enforcers of the code were, every so often you you see 
gags that you just can't imagine how they got through. That's one yeah. of them. Yes. Another one. Is, another one is when Chico's hat erects in Love Happy. Exactly you know, right. Excellent see, point. I always wondered he, about that. He sees her with a light behind her yes. and his hat erect. Yeah. Now what yeah. is that? Yeah. Exactly. That's an erection. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's like a gag for Chico, isn't it? Have a gag. But your point is excellent. I, I wondered about that too. W.C. Fields getting back him. He did the bank kick. How did they get away with that title in those days? And then he had that movie, there's the Black Pussy Cafe. Literally, the Black Pussy Cafe. How would they yes. ever get that by the censors? I'll never know. If you go, let's go to the Black Pussy Cafe. That would be funny nowadays in a Porky's film, but let alone a film in the 40s. <laughs> I love the way you think Porky's films are nowadays. Eddie. Yeah, you're right. You're right. 30 years ago. Good point. Good point. Not much to say again. I'm, w- I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> the films we love, I find, and this goes with any film we love, you know, the Maltese Falcon or whatever film we like, Grease or anything. We can, or a hard day's night. I can analyze for hours. And again, the films we love with the Marx Brothers are the same. I can analyze them and talk about them for hours. You'll find that as the, I will go down my list, I'll have less and less to say about every film because I don't have that affinity for them. I don't love every scene or, you know, whereas Horse Fellows Monkey Miss, I can talk about every scene. I know every line. Eddie, we're just the opposite here. We have more to say about the uh, the ones we don't like as much because we, we try and figure out what went wrong and why it went wrong. Right. Good point. Well, we'll get to that when we come to the last two, of course. Well, we can analyze okay. what exactly went wrong. <laughs> okay. Then we go to my next one. I'm going to go with the big store. The big store is an interesting one in that Groucho and Harpo are together. It's the one. It's always Chico and Harpo are these pals. They're these kindred spirits. And Groucho's like, you know, like and with the Zeppo wins, Groucho had somebody to team up with the Zeppo. It was two and two. But this one, for whatever reason, they decided to team Groucho with Harpo. For, I don't know why they did that. Does anybody know why that was done in that movie? If it was just an attempt to, you know, to mix things up a bit. Right. I mean, they knew it was going to be their last film, though, so I can't imagine they were that worried about about coming up with anything new. But it does seem to be just just done for the sake of it, doesn't it? Because that, it hadn't been done much before. And it is a it is a breath of fresh air. Yes, it's, a bre- it's something new. You're exactly right. Yeah. I mean, you might think they would have gone the other way because yeah. it's loosely based on a Flywheel episode mm. in which Groucho and Chico were partners. Interesting. Okay, so what's next? Go West. Uh, okay, I didn't like the opening scene. I thought it got off to a bad start. The nine dollars check. Groucho and Chico have had these wonderful scenes together. The contract scene, Tootsie Fritzy ice cream, the scene in Animal Crack. This one I thought didn't work. I thought it fell flat. I just didn't like it. Uh, nine dollars change because it went on for pretty long. I never thought it was funny. I didn't like it. Um, trying to remember if I got any good laughs out of Good West. Oh, yeah. Okay, here's what I like. I like the Harpo gunfight scene. I thought that was funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, then they have, of course, the train scene at the end. That was that was pretty funny, I guess. But a few isolated gags here and there, but not much to talk about for me. Anyway, what's your, mm-hmm. what's your mm-hmm. thoughts on Go West? Although I, I want to hear your podcast, so I'm sure you'll talk about it. So I'll listen to that. We're, we're saving that one, really. Okay. okay. I think it it's it's probably, I, I, certainly my least favorite. I think it's most people's least favorite is it i can't remember no and bob is it yours it's <laughs> you're kidding right <laughs> i think i i have it near the end not quite at but near the end you guys in other words you guys think it's worse than room service and love happy i do yes perhaps laugh wise yeah. go west has a few more but you know it doesn't hold my interest as a film i i prefer the other two that's it i find it very depressing yeah i, I can totally see that okay my next one i'm gonna go of these two Love Happy, which I've, unlike the last one on my list, I'm sure you all know what it is by now. But Love Happy, I've seen it probably a dozen times. It's Harpo. Okay, this is this fascinating guy. And he does have a lot of funny gags. Frank Pashlin, you know, who wrote gags for Jerry Lewis for years, is a great gag man. So it had a lot of funny moments. In. This is how I see Love Happy, okay? This is how I see it. I'll tell you, I was married for two years in the 80s. And I was making big money in these days. I was doing movies and I was doing pilots and voiceovers. And I, I was all over these cartoons. Tons of money. So my wife and I, what we love most was we'd go out to dinner. It was a great time. We'd go to these fancy restaurants in Beverly Hills. We'd have dinner. Now, we go to this place called Chasen's. It was a great Hollywood restaurant. And we, one night we go, oh, this is Chasen's. And she lo- you had to have a jacket. Linda gave me her jacket. Anyway, we ordered champagne and caviar. You know, we're living. We literally had champagne and caviar. We both had fillets. We had chocolate mousse for dessert. And it was the greatest meal we ever had. It was wonderful. So, okay, you know what? Let's go back tomorrow. And we went the next day. And you know what? We had the same, and the caviar wasn't as good. And the champagne didn't taste as delicious. And the chocolate mousse was kind of, we were sick of it. And that's Harpo. That's <laughs> love happy. This guy, Harpo was so special. 
He was so wonderful. You could only see him in these limited. There was something special about this guy coming in and out of the movies. He does the Punch and Judy scene, which I love. And then you had you cut away. And then you see Groucho do a scene in Chico. You couldn't sustain Harpo for an hour and a half. It was too much. I say with Love Happy, was it wasn't necessarily too much of a good thing. It was too much of a great thing. This guy was maybe the greatest comedian in history, but an hour and a half of it was too much. It was too much of a great thing, and it just didn't work. Also, obviously, they were getting kind of long in the tooth here. They were in their 60s, you know. Chico looks like, you, you really looks old. Harpo looks really old. Groucho looks kind of all right, but they're starting to look really, really old by Love Happy. It, it just didn't work. Uh, getting back to your Harpo point, yes. which is quite valid, when you center a film on Harpo, you have to give him motivation. Yeah. You know, and the best Harpo is when there is no motivation or logic to his actions. Right. Yeah. You're, you love Harpo when he's like, why would he do that? Or why is he doing that? But when when you give him a plot, you have to understand why he's doing what he's doing. And that, yes. that erases some of the magic. Right. Absolutely. Even something as simple as showing where he lives. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, you, we see he, he, he's living in this little sort of shed, right. and, and, you know, we, we shouldn't know that. We should wonder. Excellent point. We should want Excellent to know. Excellent point, Matthew. Yeah. They're trying to get Chaplin aspect I think, Matthew. You can show Charlie Chaplin living in a shed that worked. Chaplin, he was going after Chaplin pathos and all this stuff, you know. Exactly. Yeah. But Harpa lives in a doghouse that was tattooed on his chest. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, right. Although there's always an exception, and I think the background to his personal life that we get in Duck Soup is well worth the detour. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's also interesting, Eddie, that your yeah. your bottom two choices, your least favorite Marx Brothers films, are the two that were not intended as Marx Brothers films in the first Good place. Good point. Excellent. Right. Had to bring yeah. it up to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but and they, they and they both had to be marketed that way in order to right. uh, to, to get made. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Harpo came close with what he was supposed to do. Andrew Cleese and the Lion which would have been an interesting one. It never came oh, to yeah. pass. Yeah. Uh, the treat, of course, we all wait to see that wonderful scene of a young Marilyn Monroe. That one scene to see her on screen, she's so delightful. That kind of makes it all worthwhile. I wonder if Chico tried weaseling his way into that Marilyn Monroe scene. I would, yeah. Groucho says in the scrap, he says, I think he did, but he's not sure. I, I think it's obvious, yeah. <laughs> hey, Chico, what are you doing on set today? You don't have a scene. Yeah, right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, you know, he right. couldn't make it with Margaret Dumont, right. so he just said, <laughs> <Right. laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> But you're right, it is all in, in the balance, isn't it? I mean, we've been talking a lot about the Beatles for obvious reasons, and, and there's that, that the quote in my book that, where Groucho is talking about the Beatles films, and he says, you know, uh, there was something about the about the the combination of me and Harpo and Chico that worked. And and Groucho yes. actually says, I don't know I don't know what it was. Yeah. But but there is there is something. And if you and if you overbalance any of those elements, I mean even even Groucho, you know, even Groucho solo films, you know, the, I know they're not great movies, but even if they were, he would still be too much of a great thing on his own. Yes. There's just something magic, magical about the balance. And yes. with Love Happy, you know, it's it's probably, it's not a bad Harpo film. I mean, right. it's, I appreciate I appreciate it's very much not the film he wanted it to mm -hmm. be. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good Harpo right. film. But it's just, it, it's not a Marx Brothers film and you can never pretend it is. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about Matthew. What you're describing is that wonderful yeah. word chemistry. That's what, and they had this great chemistry. Whether yeah, it's Gilligan's Island or whatever. Some kind of magic that these <laughs> seven cast members all coming together, and they never did anything except maybe Jim Backus had some great stuff, but it was never the same separate with the Marx Brothers or with any great combination. There's this chemistry, and with the Beatles, we can argue again. The Beatles, there was this chemistry that set the world apart, and they were all four good solo. They all had some good songs, and they did this and that. But the magic in that chemistry is what shook up the world. Well, Matthew makes a good point. Even if you had Groucho at his best in a solo film, you know, Animal Crackers or Horse Feathers Groucho, I don't think that characterization is enough. You need the other brothers. Hmm. I was always, when I, when I saw Groucho's solo films, I was always, you know, this is Groucho, you know, and I, I was always disappointed. I, they were never that, what were they, um, uh, Copacabana, A Girl in Every Port, and I, I didn't get hardly any laughs at all. And this is like maybe the funniest guy in the history of the world, but it goes to show again, it goes, script makes a difference. Maybe the scripts are weaker. I don't know. Or maybe he needed Harpo and Kicker there. It's like they, they had, um, uh, Desi Arnaz had an interesting quote in an interview that he said, and I love yeah. Lucy. He goes, he goes, Lucy was the show. He goes, we were all props. We were all just props, but Lucy was the show. And then I, and then you see later on the Lucy show, and here's Lucy. She did, and they were terrible. They were very mediocre. Whereas I love Lucy's this comedy classic. And I think Desi Arnaz was too hard on himself there. What it was as Lucy had these great 
ensemble here. He had her, he had him, Vivian Vance, and William Frawley, who was hysterical. And they were really important characters. I think he was like giving himself sort of drift there. There was like this chemistry mm-hmm. between those four that made I Love Lucy Mae. Lucy was obviously the star. The, the four of them yeah. all really contributed an important thing. All right. Last but certainly least, we get to my worst film. This is the only Marx <laughs> Brothers film I've only seen one time, so I don't know that much about it. I remember really? oh, okay. it's called Room Service. Now, if you know the Beach Boys, Room Service is to the Marx Brothers what Kokomo is to the Beach Boys. This is the Nader, the worst movie they did, unequivocally in my mind. I, got, I remember I saw it, and I got one laugh out of it. My only laugh was the scene where Harpo is supposedly dead, and he's like, uh, and then a, a pretty girl comes by, and Harpo looks up at him, and Harpo checks her out. And that was like a funny gag. Mm. That was like the only laugh I got out of it. Now, you analyze what went wrong with room service. Okay. You cast Marilyn Monroe as a Catholic nun in a movie. No, no, they, that's not true. Okay, well, let's cast Elvis as a librarian. Let's make El- No, no, that, no matter how good the script is, Elvis is not going to play a librarian. And this is, it, the Marx Brothers were so unique, so special. You had to write for Groucho, Chico, and Harper. This is roles they inherited. This is roles that have been on Broadway, and it didn't fit any of them. It didn't work in any way. Uh, I've never understood mm-hmm. why they did. I always thought, here's a theory off the top of my head, and this might be just a totally capricious bad theory. But it's been some kind of revenge factor on Zeppo's part. We go, okay, you guys put me through this shit for 15 years. Now I'm going to hook you. I'm going to put you in this film called Room. The worst possible choice he could have made. I, I never understood why they, they were at the height of their powers after Day at the Races. Well, actually, Groucho did address this. I, I found an interview where he said that, you know, the last two films they had done were a lot of work uh, with the road tours right. and the rewrites and everything. And they were looking for something that was just a little less stress on them, you know, a script that they could just slip into, preferably something that was a hit. And he goes on to say that if it worked out, that they would go and do more along these lines. So perhaps it's just as well that it, it wasn't a success. You know what? That, that's a great explanation, Bob. I, I never heard that. That would might explain it. It just, it didn't work for me in any way. Uh, yeah. The Marx Brothers, it, it was such a letdown for me. I've, I've never watched it again. I, and I never had any interest to watch it again. The first thing I want to know then, Eddie, is if you've only seen it once, when did you see it? How old oh, were God. you? How long you ago? Know that, it's quite, I, I, I want to give you an honest answer, and I honestly don't remember. I might have seen it like 30 years ago, 25 years ago. It took an hour and a half out of my life. You know, I just, I just have no interest in seeing that movie again. I would say just give it give it one more try. It's not a film that I make huge claims for. Right. I mean, I appreciate ev- everything that everybody says about it. I, I basically agree with. But at the same time, if you put it in the context of the second half of their careers, forget the Paramounts and The Night at the Opera, but if you're looking at this kind of slight wilderness that is the second half of their careers, it does have a few things going for it. Uh, th- firstly, their centrality, the fact that they're in virtually every scene. They're the stars. They're there's no uh, extraneous rubbish. It's all about mm-hmm. them, uh, and and secondly, that they're that they're um, they're only out for themselves again. They're not they're not trying to help anyone out. They're just right. trying to make money, and they're they're basically crooks, mm-hmm. and they're and they're go, hanging going by the seat of their pants. It's not a great movie by any means, mm-hmm. but but for those reasons, I like it slightly more than a lot of people do. Okay. Very, very good analysis. I'll I, check I it out too. again, Matthew. I, I, room service is not unpleasant, right? You know, like, it's, like the, in the way that to me, Go West and At the Circus, although funnier and truer to the Marx Brothers in their way, uh, those films are a little unpleasant. Mm-hmm. And room service is just kind of—it's wrong, but it's not. I don't find it uh, awful. Okay, interesting. Well, again, it's just as we make this point over and over on your uh, on your web page on the Marx Brothers Council. It's all subjective, you know. It, it all comes down to all. There could be some sh- Schmendrick, you know. Uh, you know, uh, carrot top is funnier than the Marx Brothers, and you go, "Are you serious?" <laughs> the Marx Brothers, these great, but, but in his universe, it's funny. The classic yeah. example, of course, John Lennon with Yoko Ono. You know, we all, all of us, the rest of the world, we see Yoko Ono. Goes Yoko Ono. This is creature. You know, she she looks weird. She has no talent. She doesn't seem like that <laughs> nice. She doesn't seem that bright. She has nothing to offer. But to John Lennon, you know, this is, she's like Cleopatra. She's like this goddess. She's this talented, brilliant artist. It's through, again, it's through his eyes. You know, we all see the world through our own eyes. We all live in our own universe, you know. And in our universe, and in millions of others, we see the Marx Brothers. There can't be anything funnier. These are the funniest guys that ever walked the earth. But there are people walking around. They don't, you know, my brother's one. He doesn't care about the Marx Brothers. My sister loves them, but my brother doesn't care for the Marx Brothers. You know, it's all subjective. So what film would Yoko fit best in? 
<laughs> good, question. good question. She's not quite good enough to be in room service. I'll put it that way. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you this. Now that you've gone through your list, is there any film that you've changed your opinion of over the years that used to be higher or lower that you've moved moved a bit? That's a good question. Not necessarily so. I would say, Bob, to answer that, I can give you an honest answer. I think when I was a kid, because I fell in love with Harpo, Love Happy Men more to me as a kid. I just go, you know, I read Harpo Speaks. I read it like five or six times. And they go, this is the coolest guy that ever lived. Groucho says of Harpo, he goes, <laughs> This guy would come into a room and dogs and children would gravitate towards him. This guy was like, he's the person we all aspire to be. He's like this angel that came to earth. And I was so fascinated by everything Harpo. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing Love Happy. And the first time I thought I was enthralled. It's a great question. And I, I didn't hate it or dislike it. I just go, this is Harpo. And I watched it and I wasn't bored or anything. But nowadays it, it, it's kind of tedious to see him like for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, anyway, do you have anything going on uh, these days or anything coming up that we should be looking for? Most of, because of the virus, you know, I, I made my living doing signing shows. We go around yeah. and show, we do these things called signing shows where, okay, you get all this money, you charge $25 a picture, and everybody comes to tell you how great you are. You know, it's like, what's not to love? <laughs> Barry mm -hmm. Pearl and I are going, are you serious? We make this how we make our living? Mm -hmm. That's what I did now because of the virus, you know, we don't do those right now. So I can't do those. We obviously we can't film now. And I, I was, you know, very sick last year. I was, I was this close to dying last year, but right. I'm 100% better now. What I do now to channel my creativity is Facebook. I'm, I'm on Facebook every day. Go to my Facebook page. I write jokes every day. I write essays, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm such a nerd. I'm such an idiot. I have a pad by my bed. And I'll wake up at 3 in the morning like I'm out to it. Okay, this is a funny joke. And I'll write that. I'm going to put it <laughs> on my Facebook page tomorrow. I'm on eddiedeason.com. You can go to my web page. Uh, that's about all I'm doing. Right now. I, I, I might be doing a low-budget film with these guys uh, soon, which I'd like to. I'd love to get in front of the cameras again. And uh, that's about all. No, mostly I'm, I'm in the Facebook. I'm a Facebook addict. Well, I happen to know a couple of things you have going that perhaps you're too humble to mention. Uh, you did a commentary track for this uh, cult film you did back in the 80s called yes. Surf 2, where you're actually the top build performer. And uh, my wife and I saw it recently, and we really enjoyed it. So we're looking forward to this uh, new version. Please, that comes out on Memorial Day weekend. I got to work with the great Cleavon Little, you know, the sheriff from Blaze's house. Nicest guy ever worked. He's just a super nice guy. And it was fun to see Ron Palillo in there. Ron Palillo. Yes, he was my old pal. He was a great guy. He sadly, Ron died. He was like a three-pack-a-day smoker. Uh -huh. You don't think of him that way, but he died of cancer, sadly. But he was the greatest guy in the world. We were pals for years, very close friends. And I miss Ron to this day. But great cast. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. And thank you, Bob. I forgot about that. And another thing I wanted to mention, there is a documentary on Laurel and Hardy called On the Trail of Stan and Ollie. And uh, I don't know when the film's coming out, but there's a trailer for it online you might want to look for because uh, Eddie is uh, interviewed in that. So I assume he's going to be in the upcoming film. Laurel and Hardy, we didn't get into them that much here, but I love them so much. Laurel and Hardy, I, I like their shorts much better than their features. But in those shorts, they were some of the funniest films ever. I love them so much. And yeah, I did do a, an interview. We actually went to the old Grease location. They told me to, we drove to where we did Greece, where we filmed the, the uh, dance scenes and we did the interview there. And it was like, Ross is a wonderful guy. And that was really fun. So I'm anxious to see that when it comes out. You should be my agent, Bob. I forgot about this stuff. <laughs> we got to get you on Cameo, Eddie. Yeah, well, you know, I was on, again, Bob, before I got sick, I was on Cameo and I was churning them out. But then I got sick. I couldn't do them anymore. My uncle Leo is coming out in early May. And he's going to get me a phone where I can get back on Cameo. But I love doing that. I love that. Well, as your new agent, I'm going to call my buddy Steve Stoller and uh, get you an audition for the uh, Raised Eyebrows film. What do you think of that? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, really. I can play Groucho. Yeah, God forbid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Only, yeah. As a comedian, I'm only late years away from this guy. But you know, it, it would be something. <laughs> Steve is a very nice guy. My problem, as you guys know, and I've had occasion on your piece, the, the all caps people. Oh, he writes in all caps. Eddie, please stop yelling. Or Eddie, why are you yelling? It's like, oh, gee. Mm -hmm. I write in all caps. Okay. We're having mass genocide and rape and racism and sexism in the world. And you get upset that I'm all that. Some people, that's very upsetting. So I just go, please just block me. It's some, block me. I'll never know about it. If you don't like the old caps, just block. I don't want any trouble because I, I want to stay on your page. I love your page. It's a great joint. I visit it every day. Again, I, if we're at the end of the show, I have to say, as I've said it a million times, you guys' show, your podcast is so far beyond. And Facebook has a lot of great pages. And the Marks Brothers Council is a great Facebook page. 
but it's it's like as good as you know. I go to the Turner Classics page. I go to the three series, and it's a great page. It's as good as that. What fe- what sets you guys apart is your podcast. There's nothing like it remotely on Facebook. Your podcasts are so brilliant. They, they should be in the Library of Congress. Really, they're that. Good. <laughs> you three are all. You three are all so wonderful. You're all. You're funny. You're insightful. You work off each other so well. The, the the teaming of you three, the way you play off each other, is so perfect. I've listened to six up now. When I was sick in 2020, I tried listening to some. I, maybe this would cheer me up. I was literally too sick and too much in pain. My heart hurt, and I couldn't appreciate it. Now I'm back healthy, and I listen to them, and they're just such a joyous experience. They're funny. They're insightful. I learn stuff, and I'll sit in my room, and I'll be laughing at some of you guys' remarks. I'm laugh like an idiot alone in my room. I wish mm-hmm. Matthew said that. And you'll have these great insights, and I, I learn from every show. I, I've heard six of them now. And again, Andrea, if you hear this, I really validate you. You're wonderful on these shows. You too, but just keep up the great work. Keep up these great boxes. I want you to cover all the films. And you did the Zeppo one. I don't know if you've done one for Harpo, Chico, and Groucho. And I want to hear all three of those. I'm, I'm sure you'll get into those. But to you guys, just keep up the great work. They're incredibly entertaining shows. Thank you so much. Thanks, that, that means Thank a lot you, to... Eddie. Sure. Well, I guess that's going to about do it for now. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. And I hope you're checking out our back catalog because we have 33 wonderful episodes, uh, plus a couple with Jay Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so that's going to about do it. Uh, before we go, Eddie, why don't you introduce our final song? This is one of my favorite Marx Brothers songs you can hear from one of my favorite Marx Brothers movies, uh, one of my favorite Marx Brothers soundtracks. And here's the song. Here it comes. I'm going to play the theme from Room Service, by the way. Two blind loves. <laughs> Everyone says I love you. The cop on the corner and the burglar too. The preacher in the pulpit and the man in the pew says I love you. Everyone, no matter who, the folks over eighty and the kid of two. The captain and the sailor and the rest of the crew says, I love you. There are only eight little letters in this phrase you'll find. But they mean a lot more than all the other words combined. Everywhere, the whole world through. The king in the palace and the peasant too. The tiger in the jungle and the monk in the zoo says, I love you. Brothers Council podcast is hosted by Matthew Conium, Noah Diamond, and Bob Gassell, and is produced and edited by Bob Gassell. Matthew Conium's books, The Annotated Marx Brothers, and That's Me, Groucho, are published by McFarland. Noah Diamond's book, Give Me a Thrill, The Story of All Say She Is, is published by Bear Manor Media. Both can be found at major book outlets. For more info on this and all episodes, visit our website at MarxBrothersCouncilPodcast.com. Also look for us on Twitter. And for the place to talk Marx and meet fellow fans, join us on the lively Marx Brothers Council Facebook group. See you next time! The last show I listened to was about three nights ago. I heard your Zeppo Mark show. Oh, yeah. Remarkable. I listened for the two-hour show. You actually made Zeppo Mark sound fascinating, which is an impossibility. <laughs> it was so fascinating. You should call your show. This Here's an idea for your show. You call it Matthew, Noah, Bob, and sometimes Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
take it off that book. She is so wonderful in these shows. I go, oh, isn't that cute? They're going to have a girl on the show. Isn't that great? All my sexist buttons kick in. And she knows everything. She's a brilliant Marx Brothers genius. She was so entertaining. And uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And she, she kept saying all through the show, I know she, how hot Zeppo was. It's like, okay, I, I know, you, you're turned on by Zeppo. How hot Zeppo was every 10 minutes. No, <laughs> but throw a bucket of water on Andreas. I know it's like, so, <laughs> Just to make sure we have the girl fans here, like Irving Thalberg knew the Marx Brothers didn't have many women fans, just to get the women fans. And I asked my gay brother and my sister, who are the hottest Marx Brothers in order. I asked yeah. my brother first. He's not a big fan like me and my sister. I go, who's the hottest Marx Brother? you? Who's the, the best? Look? He goes, okay, they're all ugly. So none of them are go. He goes, Groucho is ugly. Harpo is ugly. And I don't know the other two. So that one we just throw out. Now, I asked my sister, who's the hottest Marx Brother. She goes, Zeppo is definitely number one. She said, Zeppo is definitely hot. Chico number two, I, she, I go, can you see what all the women saw in Chico? And she goes, yes, definitely. Chico had this appeal. She goes, he was really confident. And that's very appealing to a woman, a really confident guy. That was Chico's appeal. Then she goes, Harpo and Groucho, it's kind of close. She goes, she goes, Harpo had that sensitivity. So I like him. And she goes, I love curly hair. I'd love to run my hair through Harpo's hair. So she goes, I'll put Harpo third and uh, Groucho fourth. Hmm. What about your ranking, Eddie? Of uh, the hottest? All right, yeah. well, I'm not comfortable enough in my own skin, Durant, but let's see. I would say the hottest Marx Brothers. It's something I never thought of. It's like when I talk about Billions Island with women, and they'll say the <laughs> professor was hot. And I'll go, this is something I've never thought of in 50 years. I never thought the professor was hot, you know. But uh, I guess that Zeppo would be kind of cute. Yeah, Zeppo, then Chico, Groucho, then Harpo for me. Yeah. <laughs>